Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Red Menace. So, um, for this month's episode of Red Menace, we actually decided to do something a little different. I know last month we promised that we were going to read uh, Marx's work on the Paris Commune, and we are going to read that for next month. So if you have already read that or are in the process of reading that, we just basically have a little extension <laughs> to finish reading that before our next uh, month's episode on that text. But for this month, we did a little crossover with Rev Left Radio and interviewed JMP, Allison and I both uh, interviewed uh, J. Malfawad Paul on his new book, Demarcation and Demystification philosophy and its limits. We think it works really well on both shows because obviously what we do on Rev Left Radio is about, you know, communist uh, philosophy and theory along with history and politics and organizing, etc. On Red Menace, we really focus on philosophy and theory. And so this text sort of was like the perfect text for both shows. And so uh, Allison loved it as much as I did, and we decided that we were just going to do a double interview. Um, so this is a slight departure from normal Re- Red Menace episodes in that it's more the Rev Left interview style, uh, but it is Allison and I doing the interviewing. So it is a, a proper crossover. So yeah, with that said, let's go ahead and get into this interview that Allison and I conducted with J. Malfawad Paul on his new book, Demarcation and Demystification. Enjoy. Okay, uh, my name is Joshua Malfawad Paul. I'm a philosopher who teaches as contract faculty at York University in Toronto, and much of my work is on the philosophy of Marxism. Absolutely. And we're very happy to have you back. I mean, at this point, you've been on uh, Rev Left so many times, it's hard to keep track. Um, but everything you do is is, is hugely in- influential to me. Um, and so that's why you're on again. And I do want to say, I think, uh, I, I don't want to speak for Allison, but I think I can safely say that you know, you really have been a huge influence on me and Allison as individual Marxist thinkers, as well as on our show Red Menace, where we take a lot of the stuff that we've learned from your work and that you forced us to think through and really put it into practice and help other people learn along those lines, too. So thank you so much for all your work. And I just really want to just you know emphasize how much of an impact it really does have on us and how we think. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for the appreciation. It's good to know my work is useful. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So let's go ahead and just jump into these questions. Uh, There's a lot of stuff to cover. So I think the best way to open up um, something like this, especially for listeners who haven't read the text, is just maybe do like a a bird's eye view of what you're trying to do in this text. So what was the motivation behind writing this book and how would you summarize its main thesis or argument? The idea of this book for me, it it started nearly a decade ago, I think. I mean, I started writing it before um, the first books I published and it just kept going through different revisions. And it, it was something I was even before I started writing it, it was kind of an idea that was percolating like right after I defended my dissertation. Mm-hmm. And I, I was starting to think about my methodology and, and you know, the question of, of what made the kind of thing I did, philosophy, instead of political theory or political economy. Uh, so when I began to think about that, I also began to think about what made philosophy philosophy, uh, particularly in the book, uh, what I call the shadow of the eleventh thesis, and, and that mean, that means that you know the shadow cast by Marxism, encapsulated in the eleventh thesis of Feuerbach, uh, which as I'm sure you know, we all know, for, you know, Marxist for a while that you know the, that thesis is quoted all over the the place. Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. Uh, the point is to change it. So um, with that in mind, I guess you can say the main thesis of my book is the way in which I think through that 11th thesis of Marx's and how it should be read in light of the unfolding trajectory of Marxist theory. So, you know, I I kind of have this way of looking at it where I, I see it as saying philosophers have only interpreted the world because that's all philosophy can do, even if it was once thought that philosophy and thinking and contemplation was the basis for world change. And so my point is that philosophy can't change the world, even if its history has made this claim. So when we demystify philosophy, we come to the understanding that philosophy has a much more modest role to play, but still an important role. Uh, and and in, in many ways, this it has always played this role, but it's, it's kind of veiled it uh, in these kind of grandiose metaphysical notions. And that role is to clarify thought, which means investigation, interpretation, inter- intervention, demarcation. Uh, and I also talk about how philosophy is always conditioned uh, by what I call a political decision, meaning the philosopher's conscious or unconscious class commitments. And that's, I guess, pretty much the thesis in a nutshell. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just like this book did for my understanding of philosophy as a Marxist, very similar to what uh, continuity and rupture did for me as a Marxist trying to understand science. And so I, I really like that, you know, having read CNR and engaging with this text, I really like sort of reading them next to each other or just having one in mind while I read the other, because they, they do sort of, you know, address those two things that I think a lot of Marxists, for a bunch of reasons that aren't always, you know, their fault necessarily, they, it's hard to have a really good, robust, principled understanding of just how science and philosophy exist within Marxism and how they relate to one another. We'll get into that question specifically in a bit, um, but I'll bounce it over to, to Allison to uh, either give feedback or, or go to the next question. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, I also found this text very clarifying uh, in terms of the Levin thesis in graduate school was something that would come up a lot in my philosophy department that we were wrestling with to try to figure out what it means from a Marxist perspective. And I actually think I'd kind of come at it more from one of the perspectives that you criticize in this text in the past. So really having like a text that focuses very strongly on reinterpreting that in a way that is sort of at odds with how it was taught to me in graduate school, I found really refreshing. I kind of come away from this book feeling like I have a more humble view of philosophy in a lot of ways, and I actually really appreciated how that sort of challenged a lot of my presuppositions about what, you know, philosophy is as a core concept. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I definitely would have come away with, you know, uh, similar notions that I criticized as well, and it was, you know, kind of working through it and, and being self-critical of this kind of pomposity that a lot of philosophers have, and thinking about it in the whole context of Marxism, that I, I, I came to that perspective that I put out in the book. Awesome. So yeah, let's go ahead in that case uh, and just go ahead and get into the next question then. So uh, I sort of had a question that might help for sort of introducing some of the terminology in this book. So demarcation, demystification, it sort of follows your previous work and employing this notion of terrains and theoretical terrains. So I was wondering if you could explain for our listeners just briefly, like what a theoretical terrain is and why you settled for a metaphor of terrain and cartography when discussing this subject matter. Uh, well, you know, it definitely is an extended metaphor. And, and as I, you know, kind of maybe overstate in the book, it's not meant to be an ontological concept. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, an extended metaphor that I, I thought was useful in clarifying matters, and, and hopefully it is. And, you know, I, I, I started using terrain. Um, I, I wasn't the first to use this terrain. Uh, a lot of people talk about theory as a terrain, but I do use it in my own way. So when I employ it, I mean, just to kind of talk about this extended metaphor and what it means, I mean an organized body of theory. So a theoretical train being an organized body of theory, and, and that is an organized body of conceptual thought that attempts to make sense of the world. And, and the kind of theoretical trains could be, you know, religious or artistic, social or psychological, uh, or, or things like that. You know, a, a theoretical terrain doesn't have to be correct to be a theoretical train. It's just that something is put forward as a theory of saying what there is. Um, but I do point out that the most important theoretical trains, or at least I try to argue this, and I hope I do it well, are scientific ones since they establish truth procedures. And of course, I include historical materialism as uh, you know, one of those scientific <laughs> terrains. Um, and, you know, I, I call them terrains. You know, I like that metaphor, too, because, you know, these kind of bodies of, of theory, they, they tend to have something like a topography and they have what you could call different provinces within them. Uh, so it's, it's useful to kind of think about it like that, again, metaphorically. So, you know, for example, you can think about religion as like, you know, a broad theoretical terrain and then, you know, have these kind of different regions, different expressions of religion being different regions. And even within those regions, you have different theological commitments that are, you know, different kind of like sub sub theoretical trains. And they all contribute to a kind of theoretical topography that philosophers of religion study, say, for example, in religion. And, you know, and, and since I said again that the most important ones are the scientific ones, it, it's really easy to see how the sciences, uh, you know, as when you think about them as a, as a terrain, that metaphor, that they also clearly have subregions. So if you think of like, you know, just the, the, the divisions between the so-called hard scientists being these different provinces like biology, chemistry, physics, whatever. And then even within, you have these different, again, articulations within them, different types of biology, different types of chemistry, and of course, borders that are shared often between them. Um, but, you know, one of the one of the reasons, of course, that I, I use it is also to explain the second order practice of philosophy. And that, you know, brings up the metaphor of cartography. And so, you know, what I'm trying to get at is that you know, philosophy, when I talk about it just being about interpreting the world, philosophy by itself uh, doesn't establish the theoretical sense of the world, 
although you know it's been conflated with that in the past in the way philosophy has understood itself and i think we have other questions that we'll probably get into that uh, especially in the way that you know philosophy used to be tied to religion or you know emerge from it um but you know seeing philosophy as this as this practice that interve intervenes on what is theoretically established is kind of like mapping a terrain right it's also a good metaphor to explain demarcation and demystification you know because you know uh, cartographers demarcate and they demystify and you know demarcation and demystification it's the title of a book <laughs> <laughs> definitely yeah and i mean i very much found it to be a helpful metaphor i think especially the exploration of subterrains i found very useful for thinking about the relationship of certain fields of theory to sort of a broader overarching theory uh in body of theory so i found that very helpful throughout i don't know brett did you have any thoughts on it no, yeah, I really uh, – the first time I really engaged with the sort of conceptual analogy of a terrain was with continuity and rupture. And ever since then, it's really helped my thinking, and this only, you know, emboldened and, and deepened my understanding of it. And I think it's really useful because, you know, as you mentioned in the book, it, it helps clarify what we're doing here and, and how these sort of actions are taken on the, the terrain of, of, uh, of a given, you know, praxis or whatever we're talking about. Um, but let's go ahead and move on because – this question is, is pretty central to your overall book and pretty central to your argument. Um, and I referenced it a little bit in the first question I asked you, but that is just what is the relationship broadly between science and philosophy and what is the relationship between philosophy and science within Marxism specifically, especially in relation to Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a really big question. <laughs> it's yes. a question that most of the book is uh, you know, concerned with and also – what a lot of my writing is concerned with, but I'll try to do it justice in this interview. So, I mean, let, let's just begin with kind of the, I get, I possibly a well-known notion that science and philosophy way, way back used to be part of the same discipline. You know, you used to call philosophy anything that talked about the world, and that would include, you know, kind of early conceptions of what we would now call science, right? And so, you know, within the, the so-called like Western tradition, you know, the pre-Socratics were called natural philosophers. And, and, and that whole point was that, you know, they, they were called that because they were trying to give almost a scientific definition of nature. But if you read them, it's, it's pretty wacky. But, you know, they're trying to make sense of, of nature in a matter that, you know, it prefigured kind of the sciences of, or the scientists of early modernity. But their tools and, you know, the basis of their knowledge was obviously not up to the task at that period of time. But it is interesting to see that, you know, the Ionian Enlightenment with these philosophers was an attempt to break from the mystification of kind of the poets and, and priests, right? Um, the, the kind of world, you know, the, the worldview of the Odyssey or the Iliad or something like that. And, you know, similarly, in every region of the world, you find this in so-called Eastern philosophy and African philosophy and things like that. Um, when philosophy first emerges, um, it does seem to share something similar to the sciences, the attempt to kind of explain why things happen and how and, and demystify things, um, an attempt to make sense of reality, to predict it, to say what there is and how it works. So, you know, this is that's that's the, the first point I want to get to is kind of how, you know, these things get conflated together. But, um, you know, it, it becomes a little bit different now. Right. So there is a sense that, you know, a lot of philosophers want to remind everyone how philosophy is the queen of the discipline and, and you know in a certain sense philosophy did birth most of the modern disciplines which is partially partially the reasons philosophers still like to imagine that you know philosophy is the most fundamentally important thing you can study um but eventually it became clear through this whole history that you know what we started calling the sciences weren't the same as philosophy no matter how many philosophers and you can think of like hegel here uh like to call their ontological system science with you know a, a capital s um but you know I, one of the things i talk about in the book is is how you know you look at kant right there's something really interesting here in modernity um kant you know the, the great enemy kant <laughs> so many of us <laughs> in neo kant but we have to study him. But, you know, the Copernican revolution being really, really important to the sciences, right? This whole whole notion that it starts the, the emergence of the so-called new sciences and the idea that nature can be explained according to natural causes. Um, it was so important that philosophers like Kant uh, realized philosophy was being outpaced by this, these, these new sciences, right, over a period of time. And, and Kant wanted to do the same thing with philosophy. But, and I point this out in the book, 
his his whole point of this notion of a Copernican revolution in philosophy was he really just wanted to put philosophy back in place as the foundation for all of reason, including the sciences. And and this is because in many sense he was reacting to Hume, right? And we know like Hume, you talk about Hume awaking him from his dogmatic slumber. And Hume, you know, was was very troubled by the empirical method because he thought that it, it released, you know, created this problem of induction and, and you know, induction couldn't be philosophically squared with formal logic. Um, and in many ways, we can see this, you know, not actually being a problem with science, but maybe a problem with philosophy, because even though he points out that sciences have this problem, the sciences were actually succeeding at that time in generating applicable material truths. Um, so in many ways, it kind of might have made philosophy seem dubi dubious, which is where Kant comes in and he, he hoped to demonstrate that, you know, Hume was wrong and that you could square, you know, um, the sciences with a foundation of philosophy. But, you know, as I point out in the book, uh, this conceit of Kant's demonstrated what Maya Sue called a Ptolemaic counter-revolution, because what he does is in, instead of actually doing what the Copernican revolution does and says, you know, that the earth and the humans living it are not the center of the universe, like conceptually, he puts a, a very specific type of rational autonomous subject that really could only be a philosopher right back at the center of knowledge, right? So it's this kind of reaction <laughs> to the sciences. In any case, you know, what I'm getting at here is that science was coming into its own as a discipline and a theoretical terrain that could generate actual truth procedures. Uh, but the philosophy has always been troubled by this because philosophy was in some ways displaced. At the same time, uh, because philosophy is merely about thinking uh, thought to clarify it, uh, every scientist, and I point this out in the book too, also functions as a spontaneous philosopher, but they, they like to suddenly make all these explanations and meanings of what they're doing. But often it's, it's very, they do it in a very poor way, right? Um, that is unreflective of their class commitments. And you know, we just need to think about some, some people like, you know, Dawkins and Harris, they like to pass off these claims about science that are actually very philosophical, but just very shitty philosophical <laughs> understanding <laughs> random as science. So, you know, science also is conditioned by class struggle which I guess brings us to the second part of the question about Marxism. And, you know, I, I feel too that Marxism was a break from the perspective that philosophy was foundational to science and, you know, instead proclaimed that philosophy only interpreted the world. And, and this becomes clear because Marx and Engels' core project and the way they said it, they didn't, didn't say they were creating a new philosophical system. They said they were creating a science of history, right? And the project that they initiate becomes the unfolding of revolutionary theory that's intended to be scientific, what, you know, they called and what we now call historical materialism. And you get this whole history in, in Marxist philosophy of trying to make a distinction between the science and, and, and the philosophy of Marxism, which is something I talk about a bit. Um, I'm not going to get into big detail here, but, you know, understanding how the science is foundational. But it's also a science that is aware that class struggle is the motion of history. Yeah, and that was an incredibly large question, and uh, it literally is what the book's about. So I just want to reiterate like, sort of up front, uh, as I've done in the past, Listening to this episode will, you know, hopefully get you into wanting to read the text, but, you know, 10 questions, 12 questions with the author isn't enough to uh, completely sort of replace reading the text. So if you're interested at all in this conversation and there are questions we don't get to or things that you still have questions about, highly, highly encourage people to check this book out. It's only about 200 pages too, so it's not really a big book to read and it's very accessible with regards to just how clear JMP writes. So I would urge people to... If you're at all interested in any of this, you know, to go and actually read the text directly. Um, but Allison, do you have anything to say before we move on to the next question? Uh, not really, actually. I think the next question sort of, for me at least, deals with some of these ideas about the relationship between philosophy and science. So I'm ready to just get to it if that works. Cool, yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess for me, like, my takeaway at the end of this text was having a much more humble view of philosophy compared to how I've thought of it in the past. Uh, so this idea of philosophy as, like, a means of interpreting and intervening, as opposed to sort of this classical, maybe self-aggrandizing narrative that philosophers tell themselves of philosophy as the father of the sciences, it really does in a lot of ways, like, limit the role that philosophy plays uh, within revolutionary struggle, but also within sort of academic inquiry more broadly. So uh, my question then is sort of if the role of philosophy becomes so limited when we take on this view. From your perspective, why is it worth studying? What is it that we gain by specializing in and focusing on philosophy in particular? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think uh, 
Yeah, because there's this idea that, again, that's pointed out that, you know, you want philosophy to have this, like, oh, it is the, the father of everything, right? <laughs> philosophy likes to tell this story about itself. And we're trained, if we go through academic philosophy, to think that. Um, but, you know, all I'd say here is that simply because something has limits doesn't mean it isn't worth studying. I think, you know, all of the sciences have limits, too, <laughs> and, borders, uh, and, and points of, of questions they can't answer and, like, you know, disciplinary boundaries, right? Um, my point is that if we have a more modest understanding of philosophy, maybe we can work better as philosophers. Uh, but this more modest understanding doesn't make it worthless because uh, we should get away from creating grandiose abstract ontological systems. And, and just because we can't do that doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue philosophy. It's not some zero sum game of like grandiose abstract ontological systems or no philosophy <laughs> or some bullshit you know, analytic philosophy does or no philosophy, right? Um, so I think part of the reason why it feels like to have this humbling view could feel like uh, what's, what's it worth then is because I think we're trained in philosophy in a way that we've inherited a kind of conceit, right, from the discipline. And and I know this, you know, from, you know, I'm not going to name names anymore because I can't remember them anymore, but think about, you know, colleagues at you know, grad school and everything about that and, you know, people in different departments I've met or things I've read by different academic philosophers. And, and the reality is, is that lots of academic philosophers want to see their discipline as extremely important, right? And, and you know, in, in some ways I, I get that they want to see it as extremely important because, there is this very anti-philosophical and neoliberal reasoning that has crept into academia that, you know, wants to say, well, what's the point of philosophy? We should just, you know, turn, you know, universities into a professional school or something like that. You know, I've run into these kinds of people, right? They're, they think, you know, the, the university should be medical school, law, the sciences and business. Right? Um, but, you know, philo so, you know, philosophy, a lot of philosophers want to project this aura of importance and a lineage uh, through whatever they, they accept as the canon, right, to defend the preeminence of the discipline, right, and this preeminence they feel is being lost. But, you know, in, in many ways, we don't have to, you know, capitulate to this, this neoliberal reaction. All, all we have to do is think that it's, it's you know, it's, it's worthwhile to lose the conceit. If all we lose is the conceit, when we walk away from this illusion and think through what we are actually doing as philosophers, maybe we'll gain a better understanding of what our practice is. And in this case, you know, I think this, this, this humbling view or modest view of philosophy means that philosophy is still important because, you know, as an, as an act of demarcation and intervention on theoretical trains, which is how I define it, philosophy is largely concerned with thinking thought. And, you know, and, and, and if we want to define it kind of simply like that, this, that, I guess, very pithy definition of what this book is about. Philosophy is about thinking thought. And in this day and age, it's, it, we're not really taught well to think thought, right? It's actually very difficult to think thought. You know, even within our own kind of revolutionary traditions, it's difficult to think thought. Like, people fall more easily into, like, dogmatic phrase-mongering, things like that, and actually really trying to think concepts through. Um, I, not to, not, you know, not, well, actually shameless self-promotion. <laughs> so my, my next book, which is a very small one that's, you know, coming out sometime in 2020, um, concerns the importance of thinking thought within Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, or, or how to think Maoism and how we really need to get better at this. So we don't fall into either dogmatic or eclectic styles of thinking. So if we understand that, right. Uh, we understand that when we think thought, we are always doing so according to a class perspective. And this is the broader question. We can understand how we are thinking and intervening. Um, and, you know, another way to think about this is about uh, the number of, of critical thinking courses that philosophy departments, um, you know, tend to provide these days. And they're, you know, they're not always good courses. You know, I've, I've had to teach many of these because they're the ones that contract faculty always get. They pay my bills. No one else wants to teach them. Uh, they're kind of boring. Um, so, but, you know, it's it, part of the whole claim is like philosophy is about critical thinking. Here's this course just on critical thinking. And if you look at critical thinking textbooks, they, they generally concentrate on kind of rules of formal and informal logic, the problem of fallacies. You know, distinction between induction and deduction, structures of arguments, and a whole bunch of other formulaic notions. And, and these aren't bad in and of themselves, but when I teach these courses, and what I think that, you know, when we talk about philosophy really being about critical thinking, meaning how to think thought, it also means how to understand our political commitments, the underlying tension of class struggle, and the ways in which ideology, and here particularly ruling class ideology, 
structures the world and our thoughts. So when we demystify this and we figure out how to practice critical thinking that is aware of class struggle and ideology, then we, we really are practicing philosophy. And, and this might have limits, but it's actually a really, really big thing to do. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult discipline to get. Um, but it also means that philosophy is not only practiced by the academic experts who can like figure out the meaning of like Hegel's logic, right? Um, rather, it means, and I think this is important when you make it kind of modest, but importantly modest, that philosophical practice can and should be part of any revolutionary movement. Cadre can and should become philosophers who struggle to think the thought of their theoretical train. And this is hard, but it's not impossible. It's not some specialized knowledge, right? You can learn it. But it is hard, especially when we are conditioned to be one dimensional thinkers who are better at memorizing and repetition rather than thinking and understanding. And this is you know, a very important role that I think philosophy has to play. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think especially I'm very excited for that next book, because when thinking about the state of sort of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism in North America today, I think it's very easy to see the need for sort of that critical approach to thinking thought carefully and doing it well and providing clarity through that, as opposed to just falling into, as you said, either eclecticism or dogmaticism, which, you know, are so dominant within how the movement looks and talks about itself in many ways. And yeah, I, I definitely have that, I think, sort of experience of coming through academic philosophy constantly having to hear philosophy justify its right to exist in the academy at all. So every philosophy class I feel like sort of started with here's why philosophy is the most important thing in the world just as a sort of justification for that class's existence and why you should sign up for it. Uh, so stepping outside of that after sort of years of hearing that it is sort of refreshing to get this view of actually no maybe that is a self-conceit that we've been telling ourselves and maybe actually what we're doing is more focused and modest than that in a way that's actually very useful useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, you know, put it by putting it in its proper place um, and not letting it spill outside of the, the boundaries of what it can only do, it can actually make philosophy more effective, especially when we think of it in terms of, you know, the, the fight against capitalism, um, imperialism and fascism, etc. So yeah, I think that's, that's incredibly important. Um, I do want, I do want to move on and I want to talk a little bit about Althusser, uh, cause this book is, you know, clearly influenced to some extent by Althusser. And although you do make sure to gesture towards your disagreements with him, you also admit his importance as a philosopher of Marxism. So can you just talk about Althusser a bit, specifically what you think is sort of essential in his work? And even if you have time where you think he fails or comes up short? <laughs> oh man, this is a, you know, <laughs> I mean, this, this, there's like a, an entire essay or book um, could be based on my um, the things I appreciate about him and the things I do not like about him. <laughs> um, you know, actually, I, I'm, I'm kind of writing this. I, I was starting to write this, you know, long piece on the concept of the subject, um, which has a lot of my agreements and disagreements with Althusser in it. And it, it was a piece that got way out of hand. And I, I've had to shelve it because I don't know where I'm going with it anymore. Because <laughs> I just ended up on these whole tracing of disagreements that ended up like going, you know, too far beyond the bounds of the project. But I, you know, I'm going to try to to figure out how to keep it, you know, kind of short here within kind of the, uh, you know, the limits of, of, of this, of, of this discussion related to the book um, and the way that I, I connect him to the book. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the book is influenced by Althusser. Uh, he's influenced by a lot of people, but him specifically because when I was going through one of the first initial drafts, um, when I only had kind of an introduction, a bunch of other uh, chapters that I eventually scrapped. I mean, this is before um, the communist necessity. I decided I had to like return to a lot of people in the Marxist tradition that talked about the meaning of philosophy. And one of them, of course, was Althusser. Um, and before that, I kind of had dismissed him because... You know, it came through this, this, uh, the way that I was taught Marxism was by people that didn't like Althusser, right? And that usually, that ob obviously conditions your thought to anyone, right? And after a while, you got to kind of get beyond that and be, okay, I'm going to read these people fully by myself outside of this, uh, the way that I've been taught. Um, and so, you know, I'd only read a few essays of his from, you know, the, the famous ISA essay and, you know, the, the one, and I read the, uh, the four Marx book and, you know, sections of reading capital, the old version of reading capital, when it was just Balibar and Althusser. Um, so I decided to return to him when I was also returning to other philosophers to read specifically what he had to say about the meaning of philosophy. Cause he'd written a number of essays about that, that back then I hadn't, I hadn't read yet. And actually, it was there that I found a very specific love for him um, in, in that area, right? I found he was one of the clearest thinkers on the meaning of philosophy from a Marxist perspective. 
And a lot of what he was saying either accorded with what I was starting to think about at the time or clarified some of my own positions and where I was going. It was very helpful. I mean, other people were as well, but you can see the, I guess, the, the influence of Althusser there, right? I mean, and also it's, it's you know, refreshing to find a philosopher who's considered one of the great Marxist philosophers defending the notion of historical materialism as a science, at least in like, you know, the, that period of his work, the period I care about, um, and, and, um, and trying to think what philosophy meant in, in, in relationship to the science of historical materialism. Um, and, you know, I think his work on the history of philosophy and, and particularly here in thinking about, you know, philosophy for non-philosophers is, is very useful. But um, outside of that, there are a lot of areas I disagree with him. I mean, there's a lot of other areas I like him into now, but, uh, but there, are, there are a lot of areas I disagree with him. Uh, they were outside the gamut of this book, so I didn't really get into them. But, you know, I can mention some here. Sure, yeah, please <laughs> the do. The first is one I mentioned earlier on that I started when I was writing that essay about the subject, right, is his treatment of a subject, um, which, to my mind, didn't do a good job of demystifying what by his time was a confusing notion. So you get this concept of the subject that comes from, you know, Descartes, or the, the, the modern notion of subject that comes from Descartes. And it starts, you know, appearing in all these different works and things like that. And, you know, Althusser kind of didn't do a good job of actually thinking, in my opinion, thinking through what that meant. It, it was actually pretty convoluted, under, uh, like, or at least a pretty convoluted philosophizing of it. Um, and in my opinion, kind of opened the door to, Foucault's work on the subject, which I, I, I disagree with. <laughs> um, yeah, again, I'm not, I, I, and I've dealt with that elsewhere, so I won't get into why I disagree with Foucault here. <laughs> um, uh, but I do, uh, you know. So uh, also the other, the other uh, area, the second area that I kind of have a disagreement with him is his notion of the epistemological break between the young and mature Marx, and the way in, within this discussion he sometimes treats the German ideology. But at the same time, I get why he did it, right? It was this, it was to break from this petty bourgeois Marxist humanism that was all the rage at the time. And I also understand that, like, when you when I go back, like, having read Feuerbach and studied him now, like, going back to read Marx's essay on alienation, you can really see that it's just largely under the spell of Feuerbach in many areas. Like, the fingerprints are all over it, and, and Theses on Feuerbach seems like a direct reaction to essays like that by Marx, like a break from that. Um, but I think Althusser kind of overstated the distinction. And, and to be fair, that's what we do. I might be overstating many things in this book that you're reading, right? Because philosophers <laughs> like to overstate things. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and Althusser did admit that, like he was quoting Lenin saying that he, you know, perhaps bent the stick too far in the other direction in order to correct it and th things like that. But, you know, still a lot of people, when they talk about like what Althusser's philosophy is, they, they bring that point up a lot. And I guess the final area, which is, I guess, a, a larger, just more of his practice and, and more of the way he saw himself as an intellectual. Um, and this is this area that I disagree with him is his refusal to break fully from the revisionism of, you know, the Communist Party of France, the PCF. Even though he tried for a long time to wage a line struggle within the PCF against this revisionism, but there's the fact that he never leaves. He never declares solidarity with the anti-revisionist ML groups of his time. In fact, he kind of shits on them in May 68, losing a lot of his students. And he even tries to square those aspects of his philosophy, which are anti-revisionist, with the doctrinaire PCF revisionism, which you can, which leads to some of the most worst, the worst confusions in his work. So, in on the reproduction of capitalism, there's these, you know, criticisms of economism, but at the same time, post May '68, he keeps trying to push this economism. <laughs> so there's this kind of weird tension that happens there. So I guess that would be the final area where I, I really disagree with him. Yeah, in the book you mentioned May '68, and I, I think I don't have it, uh, the exact um, paragraph with me right here, but you said something about uh, something like uh, relating his sort of the limitations he hit with the sort of historical limitations of uh, Marxism Leninism at that time. I think you touched on that a little bit, but is it fair to say that some of the limits that Althusser as a thinker hit were also indicative or in some respect reflective of the limitations that non-anti-revisionist Marxism Leninism was hitting around that 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 period of time? Oh, definitely, definitely. I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. So I just sort of wanted to to emphasize that a, a bit because I think that's that's really important. 
yeah, I want to talk about uh, sort of what I think is an interesting distinction in this book, which is that you do some work distinguishing between philosophy and theory, which are two terms that all the time I hear flattened into each other or conflated without much thought to what the distinction between them might be. So I was wondering if a little bit you could explain for our listeners, you know, how you understand this distinction between the two and what do you think is at stake in making a distinction between them? Yeah, I mean, first I should probably begin by noting um, that the distinction I make is, 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 you know, a philosophical distinction. Ha ha ha. <laughs> um, it might not, it might be very semantic. And I mean, it's useful as part of the metaphor and the way I'm trying to think things. And, and perhaps I too may have also bent, bent the stick too far in one direction. <laughs> but I make it, I make that philosophical, philosophical distinction uh, for reasons of clarity. Um, after all, and, and I discussed this in the book, like historically, there is the fact that the two have been conflated. And, and I feel that that conflation has largely caused a confusion, that, and, that, and that's the confusion I wanted to get around to kind of just really think what philosophy is. So, you know, if we think in the background of what I already said about the theoretical terrain and, and the second order practice of, of philosophy, and to summarize that, right? So theory is, is largely what theorizes what there is, how it works, and that's what reality is according to a given theory's perspective. So biology, if you think of that example, explains reality according to biological matter, physics according to physical matter. Um, if you look at like, re you know, religion as a theoretical terrain, you know, it, you know, it explains reality according to notions of God, and theological concepts. So theory is kind of, uh, you know, this is X. It's, it's about this is X and, and <laughs> this is what we call X. Um, but, you know, philosophy did that. Again, remember I talked about a philosophy used to be conflated with all of these things as well, but what makes it distinct as a practice. And when I start thinking about what makes it distinct as a practice and we demystify it and how it seems to always be recursive on these kind of like uh, theoretical concerns, uh, philosophy is, is a second order of thought that tries to think the meaning of X, right? So if, if theory says this is X and this is what we call X, philosophy tries to think the meaning of X. Sometimes uh, when two conflicting theoretical expl explanations are given, right, it gets involved in trying to mapping the, the root between them and also just mapping the root of meaning on the topog topography of, of, pres of the way that theory is presented, right, the presentation of theory. So, you know, think of an example here of like, you know, two political economists. They might explain the tendency of the rate of profit to fall in two different ways. I mean, this is political economists get involved, especially Marxist political economists get involved in these debates all the time. And, they, and, they, and, and both of them might actually have the same amount of empirical data. So what is the role of the philosopher in that debate? And it's to think outside of the theory of political economy. So as to clarify the debate, it's that kind of second order from outside kind of position where it comes in and says, how do we like draw the terms of the debate? What's at stake? What position makes more sense according to what the theoretical train of political economy is meant to explain? Right? Of course, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we talk about like, you know, kind of, scientists becoming spontaneous um spontaneous philosophers well a lot of theorists in every theoretical train like to become spontaneous philosophers because they also can't help making philosophical judgments but they don't make them with the same clarity or awareness that they're making philosophical judgments they'll sometimes say that's part of their theoretical train or something like that so appealing what they do is they appeal to meaning and interpretation beyond their theoretical claims um, which is why in my opinion they should get better at doing philosophy and being aware when they are doing philosophy. And, and that's kind of in a, a way that I, I make that distinction, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I just ask because I think a lot of the times in our more uh, common use of the terms on the left, we just do not do any distinguishing work there. And that's a very helpful explanation, that I think, for people who may be struggling to think about what that distinction means in the context of this book. So thank you very much for that. That's very clarifying. Yeah, and I, I would like to add one thing, too, because I think the conflation happens again with a lot of um, political philosophy that also gets called political theory. Mm -hmm. When you look at a lot of this stuff, it's like, ooh, are you reading this theorist or that theorist? A lot of them, what they do is, in one sense, they're doing philosophy when they're trying to make these second order claims and they're actually, they are intervening on like these things that have appeared in the realm of presentation. But the other time that they have, they're doing theory as well and, and not very good theory, possibly. Like they're, they're suddenly saying, this is the name of, you know, it's like, well, look at Deleuze and Guattari. We can call these processes deterritorialization de and reterritorialization, which is just a philosophical way of thinking about the world. But they're putting it forward as if it's this kind of theoretical fact that underlines things. Or, you know, the famous on biopolitics, right? This is just like a philosophical metaphor, really. There's no 
scientific fact beyond it, right? It's just a way of talking about the way power operates uh, on on life, right? But suddenly it's like people now talk about it as like, ooh, biopolitics, as if it's this actual thing. So it's, it's, it's this theory, right? It becomes this theory. And it's that kind of confusion between theory and philosophy that just keeps it going. Yeah, it's definitely very helpful. Yeah, definitely. I think it's important for, for listeners to sort of understand this, maybe just by restating this and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you say in the book, there's this, this tight dialectical relationship between practice and theory. You know, we all know the famous Lenin quote, what is it like, without uh, revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Tying theory and movement in a dialectical back and forth is essential. And then philosophy is seen as, as you, you keep saying the, the term second order. And I just hope people can understand this is, you know, philosophy is an intervention in that already exists dialectic between theory and praxis, which sort of informs and helps understand what exactly is happening on that first order terrain. Is that a fair way of, of explaining it? Cool. Okay. So I'll just move into this next question. And I am talking, I'm going to ask another question about Althusser kind of, and part of that reason is because we're doing an episode on um, ideology and ideological state apparatuses. And I was actually reading Althusser along with um, this text. So it was sort of in my head going back and forth between the two books. But in Althusser's uh, book on the reproduction of capital, he opens the text, which you reference in your, in your book, what, with the uh, essay titled, What is Philosophy? And he does what amounts to an historical materialist analysis of the history of philosophy itself, showing how certain philosophers are canonized based on the concrete material conditions in politics and science specifically that their philosophies reflect. I just hoping that you could talk about this and maybe even give a few examples of well-known philosophers to help our listeners understand the sort of historical materialist analysis of philosophy itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember that passage in the book. Um, I was, I was actually, you know, I was, I was looking for it <laughs> recently, but uh, all, all of our bookshelves are, are now boxed up because we're, we're painting, <laughs> which makes it really hard to find shit. That I <laughs> um, but, okay, uh, you know, I'll see how much I, I, you know, I can remember of, of that. Um, and just in, in general, there's, you know, there's the general point is, is salient in, in so many ways, even beyond what Althusser would have said. Um, so, you know, I, I talk about the book and I, I've noted in this interview about how all philosophers are driven by class commitments, even when they're unaware of the political decisions they make. Uh, so it makes sense that the ways in which philosophers have been canonized have to do with concrete historical conditions of their own time and even later times. I mean, philosophy is like this kind of, you know, it's codified thought. And as we know, like, you know, uh, matter generates thought. That's, you know, <laughs> that's a point we make as, as materialists. And of course, you know, thought is influential in matter. That's why we're also dialectical materialists. I'm not going to get into that. Um, so uh, in, in many ways, when you start looking at the concrete conditions that produce certain philosophy and allowed that philosophy to persist over time, um, like, yeah, if you think back to Plato's philosophy, right, that's, you know, classic example, Plato being a classic philosopher in the canon, the so-called canon. So you can't imagine Plato's philosophy without the limits of class struggle reached in ancient Athens and the collision of that time between its so-called democracy and the fact that that democracy was buttressed by slavery and patriarchy, right? Um, and so Plato's philosophy is, in fact, this great reflection of the contradictions in a society. Whether you love it or hate it, it's still a reflection of those contradictions. So on the one hand, you have in his philosophy, this he inherits this, this pre-Socratic disdain for the order of the poets, right? Um, that's why he, he banishes them from the Republic, because the pre-Socratics also, so, I mean, because poets, and I point this out, poets, everyone's like, I, I feel this is a tangent, but I feel it's, it's important to get out there. There's, there's reasons to hate Plato. There's many reasons I hate Plato, but because he bans poets from the Republic is not a good one. Because... Um, <laughs> Because people say that, oh, man, Plato was so anti-poetry, so anti-art. But the reality is what he meant. Like poets back then weren't like people doing, you know, this, this amazing art or something like that. Right. They were considered mouthpieces of the gods. That was the definition of a poet. They were part of the priestly order. So he banishes them from the Republic because they, they speak lies. <laughs> this is kind of notion. They don't speak logic. They speak. They are they're all they all have these contradictory views of the gods. Right. The different versions of the story of the Odyssey, different versions of the story of the Iliad. So that so that's his disdain for the poets is actually inherited from that kind of almost kind of quasi scientific view that the pre-Socratics had. Um, but on the other hand, at this period of time. He's also seeing with the, you know, kind of the, the you know, the disintegration of, of, of the political order um, of, of Athens, um, that he's he's trying to replace the religious order with its own, right? This whole kind of theory of forms and things like that is the way that kind of philosophy suddenly wants to kind of beat religion at its own game, right? And this demonstrates, I mean, Elstar says this elsewhere, that philosophy's, uh, you know, philosophy first emerges 
as an attempt to replace religion, right? And that's what, you know, Plato's doing. And especially at this time that is, is very politically meaningful in terms of class struggle. And then we can think about, you know, moving on from Plato, right? We can think about like Aristotle. And I do remember Althusser pointing out that, at, you know, the end of the Greek city-state and the beginning of the Macedonian Empire is this crucial period of time. And Aristotle's philosophy appears there. It also appears uh, when the idea of biology as a science emerges, right? It's kind of this goes back to Althusser's and one of the things I pick up on this notion about, you know, philosophy tailing the sciences yeah, or the emergence of what we would eventually call the sciences, right? That time they're still incorporated in it, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, but also I think we can go further than that because a lot of what we understand as philosophy's canon gets canonized later, almost at various points. There's all these various points of canonization uh, that eventually lead up to the most recent kind of uh, centric construction Right, There's this notion of an eternal West that goes again back to ancient Greece and tries to pretend Greece was part of this eternal West, which is, you know, a lot of people have pointed out that's a weird bullshit construction, but it still plays into this construction of Eurocentrism. But you know, even before that, uh, and the stuff that leads up to that canonization, you have these very important political moments that that bring these philosophers back up again, right? Like so, Plato, who I mentioned earlier, like many generations after he's alive, he's canonized again by Imperial Rome when it was Christianized, particularly through the work of Augustine. And, and the, those material facts of, of the Christianization of Rome and, and how Rome started to understand itself as the empire and the emergence of what we would eventually call the Roman Catholic Church, um, that goes back and recanonizes Plato, but in a very specific way. And, you know, Aristotle gets recanonized you know, later by Thomas Aquinas, himself becomes historically important because he best reflects and justifies the feudal order of Western Europe. And I, I do recall start talking about Aquinas and the feudal order of Western Europe. <laughs> and of course, later on, all of these people who survived because of these concrete class struggles, um, they're further canonized by Europe's colonial adventures and, it, you know, the Europe becoming the birthplace of, of capitalism and then world capitalism. And, and as they seek kind of philosophers who justify notions, specifically notions such as natural slavery and hierarchy and things like that are very, very important in, in, when Europe comes into its understanding of itself as this conquering um, civilization. Um, so I, I think even we can go, we can talk very recently about, you know, liberal philosophy being a, a really, really good example about uh, about these kind of like concrete uh, political situations that canonize philosophy, right? So look at the, you know, the saints of, of liberal philosophy <laughs> they're, and they're core to the canon. And in fact, they actually form now kind of the lens through which we read philosophy's past. Like it, it's always read through that kind of period, right? Uh, pure canonization. And we read the entire past through these liberals, right? And we lead, and actually, and we read the present through these liberals as well, at least dominant philosophy does, the, the dominant ideological perspective of philosophy does. Um, and, and these liberal philosophers were definitely canonized based on the concrete material conditions of European hegemony, right? I mean, even if we look at you know, Hobbes, Hobbes is this ideologue of monarchy, but you know he's an ideologue of monarch, monarchy delinked from the great chain of being, right? So the beginning of this notion of, of a, you know, this authoritarian rule that, you know, is, is not necessarily connected to this feudal conception. And also, you know, Hobbes is this ideologue of European sovereignty and individual autonomy and all that kind of stuff. And so, and then after him, you get Locke, Bentham, Austin Mill, that whole rogues gallery, right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're also, they, you know, they, they, they've made a political decision to side with empire in the work, right? Even, even if they're critical of its feudal vestiges, they're still, you know, all into like, you know, the empire and things like that. And, and, and their work served as justification for empire. Um, and again, you know, I think the, the point too, going back, is that you know, science comes into this because a lot of these philosophies emerged in connection to scientific theoretical trains that preceded them, or you know, maybe not coherent theoretical trains. If you go back to, to Plato, right, they're still kind of submerged in this philosophical stuff, but it's still these notions kind of start coming up before them, right? So Plato emerged after Euclidean geometry was complete. Liberal philosophers come after Newtonian mechanics and early biological conceptions like modern biological conceptions are theorized and all of them uh, you know especially the liberal sciences so as to justify their philosophical interventions and, and obviously as we know sometimes in some pretty disgusting ways
Yeah. Well, I really, really like that. Actually, that actually is incredibly clarifying. When you say there's not only an historical materialist account of sort of when these philosophers appear, but there's also sort of a historical materialist account of sort of how in, in the moments in which they get canonized sort of retrospectively, which I think is, is you know, definitely adds a layer of analysis to what Althusser offered in, in his book. So, so thank you for that. Uh, Allison? Yeah, I mean, I think it fits with the theme that comes up in this text over and over again that's really helpful to think about is that philosophy is not separable from class struggle and that philosophers are coming from a class perspective. And obviously that, of course, you know, is going to play into the canonization that's occurring there, which is really useful to think about, I think. Um, kind of, I'm going to just go into the next question, which I might try to relate to this a little bit, which is you talk about how sort of the Marxist rupture in philosophy, it, it's led to almost like philosophical struggle and the need to respond to Marxism, whether or not one agrees with or disagrees with it, it sort of has to be responded to on a certain level because of the nature of its rupture. And in the text, you talk a little bit about how some of the post-structuralists and post-modern theorists pushed back against parts of Marxism uh, in their own sort of annihilation-based impulse. But I was wondering if you could talk about today in philosophy as a discipline, perhaps, what are the struggles against Marxism? How are people choosing to oppose to it? And which theories are, which theorists are, I guess I should say philosophers, really, <laughs> which philosophers do you see as sort of engaged at the four front of a struggle against Marxism within philosophy today? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's such a, <laughs> such a big question, too. I mean, obviously, to feel in many ways to be to be kind of a, a Marxist that is actually committed to the project of, you know, making you know, communism a reality is is to be, you know, uh, alone in many ways in <laughs> academia. <laughs> um, and even and even Mark, even those Marxists that aren't that, that just do Marxists as a theory, a lot of them are outpaced by kind of other, especially in, in philosophy. I think you see Marxism making this comeback in other ways um, outside of philosophy, but philosophy still seems strongly mobilized against it in most in most places. Um, so trying to think of like the main tendencies opposed to these or the, the philo philosophical struggles against Marxism. I mean, my, my, my initial instinct is to say what all of us who are Marxists like to say and just say postmodernism. <laughs> yeah. um, but... I feel that that often, you know, it, it's, a, it's a pretty simplistic way to look at a lot of different currents. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think much of what gets grouped under postmodernism, which, you, you know, definitely has its problems. Um, it's not the main struggle against philosophy, you know, a main philosophical struggle against Marxism today in, in philosophy departments. I mean, definitely the thinkers grouped under this rubric, and we can discuss well, actually, let's not have that discussion. Uh, you know, we, we can, you know, the whole idea of whether postmodernism is the best term for them, because it's kind of, it's more the um, pithy term to explain a lot of them. But, but those that we would say are grouped under them, like Foucault, Derrida, Leotard, and, and people like that, they definitely have promoted, and their adherents still promote, like they're, 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 they're most faithful, not people that just borrow from them, but people that are like, I am a Foucauldian, I am a Derridian, I, you know, whatever. They, they, they definitely promote uh, like all these different strains of anti-Marxism. But, you know, they're far from the main philosophical struggle against Marxism, at least in academia. And in fact, I think they're becoming, I, you know, people still like use their stuff and use their points, but to, to be this kind of a Foucauldian anti-Marxist or a Derridian anti-Marxist is, is kind of minor, I think, these days. Uh, and I, I think partly this is because for all of their antipathy to Marxism, they still possessed an ambivalence to many of Marxism's tenets and were in fact inspired, though in a, in a pretty warped way a lot of time, uh, by Marxism's radical impulse. Uh, you know, so I, I definitely think struggling against the foundational concepts of what is grouped under the term postmodernism remains an important task. And I, I continue to do so and I've done so in many places. But it is but to suddenly say, you know, postmodernism, modernism is the main enemy is, is entirely ignorant. Um, um, it, when we actually try to think about what the main opponent to Marxism and philosophy is. I mean, a lot of anti-Marxist thinkers, and if you think about, you know, charlatans who, who like what Jordan Peterson has to say, they also have a disdain for postmodernism and have this weird notion that it's the same as Marxism, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's not, I don't think that what, what gets called postmodernism is necessarily the main, uh, the main, the main enemy within academia, at least. Um, I think what, what is, you know, the, probably the main problem, and also this might be what makes postmodernism a problem too, is the overriding liberalism of philosophy. Um, so, I mean, postmodernism has this, eventually at the end of the day, you can find that a lot of the postmodernist claims are pretty liberal. But I mean, outside of postmodernism, just what many philosophy departments, which are not continental, they're like analytic, right? Um, 
there's this overriding like uh you know lineage an overriding liberalism like a lineage they trace back to, to classical liberalism and this becomes a big deal in political philosophy or what gets called political philosophy in the analytic tradition where it's the you know the, anything marxist is considered you know you can't think about that it's wrong it's totalitarian they use all those kinds of terms right um so, you know, political philosophy, mainstream political philosophy is, is the enemy of Marxism and has been the enemy of Marxism since its inception. So I, I think everything from Rawls, who's dead, but Rawls is still a name that's su uh, summoned. But if you think about like kind of uh, modern liberals like Martha Nussbaum and people like that uh, or anybody who, who abides by Mill's conception of the harm principle, that's the status quo of political philosophy and the analytic tradition of political philosophy. And it mobilizes very strongly against Marxism, right? In fact, it normalizes a non-Marxist view of politics and it works overtime to eliminate Marxist conceptions of reality from its framework. You just gotta read these people and you can see how much they are, they have, they, they, they're under the shadow of Marxism because they need to account for things Marxism talked about but they just want to obliterate it without actually referencing in any critical manner Marx, like Marxism, right? But I, I think even outside of political philosophy and this kind of, you know, this kind of analytic, you know, these analytic North American departments, liberalism is just all over the place to the point that, you know, many analytic thinkers, due to their submersion in positivism, they think they're qualified to talk about political matters like a reactionary biologist who thinks that he understands politics because science is superior to the humanities, right? This is like, this is the way they think, right? Um, I think I remember, you know, being, it's very simple things. I remember like, you're, I mean, I've, been, I've been involved in many strikes because of contract. I remember the first strike I was involved in 2008 and 2009. And I remember just the poor show out from the philosophy department right? There was like, there was 15 of us. <laughs> and we had the, it was good. We had, we had, we had a line and there was like a small amount of this, but because we were like felt attacked by the department, we had a pretty radical line. But, um, but there was people in my department who were like, oh, I don't, I know everything there is to know about this because I study philosophy of math. <laughs> right? And it's like, it's, the moment you mentioned Marx, they're like, they suddenly believe all the anti-communist shit, right? And they've never really looked into it. They just assume they're, they're you know, the experts on that. Um, in fact, they think they understand every political issue simply because they studied formal logic or normative ethics. This is the way they think, right? So this is this this, this kind of tradition. All the, all these trajectories. These are quite like the antithesis of Marxism, which is you know why you know now get these chauvinist ideologues such as like Kathleen Stock or Holly Lawford Smith and you know Brian Leader and these and these like shitheads right like they declare themselves the experts on gender and feminism and they're they write these transphobic screeds but like none of them have ever studied the body of literature on the philosophy of gender at all yet they assume with this that the, the, there are these like pure um, like logical souls that can understand everything because they studied analytic philosophy, but there's this political commitment they have. There's that political decision they make that they're just very unconscious of. And, and, and in fact, they, th these are definitely like much more kind of material enemies in philosophy departments because people like them and they themselves like play a particularly nauseous role in attacking graduate students who disagree with them and trying to discipline departments for challenging their chauvinism. And those are just three names, right? But, um, but there's other examples and there's an entire industry also of defending the so-called Western canon and its analytic expression and driving up people that are critical of that, which is why, you know, philosophy departments are still largely white and male. Um, so I think that's, that's a definite, <laughs> that whole liberal concatenation is, is a definite enemy of Marxism in philosophy. And then I would say one more, I'm, I might be going on too much on this because I just think about this a lot and I hate these people, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, outside of analytics, so I just did the whole analytic philosophy thing. Um, and I'm one of those people that's in that gray zone between analytic and continental philosophy, like, it, because that's because when you study Marxism, you are. Um, so there's things I like about both and hate about both traditions. So when I say, you know, outside of analytic philosophy, there's, you know, there's also the post Heideggerian kind of, mm. these, that's what I think is the best way to call them now. It's like these people that come from kind of like Agamben and folks like them. And I, you know, I think they're, they're more intensely um, influential as anti-Marxist than even the so-called postmodernists now. They're kind of become kind of new things, right? And they definitely don't, uh, you know, a lot of them would, would definitely not see themselves as postmodernists. Even if they borrow now and then through code, they would do the same way that 
someone else would, where they, they qualify that they don't agree with the other things that Foucault says, and, and they seem to have this kind of commitment to modernity or a, a specific notion of it. So it, it's, it's these folks that, you know, like Agamben is a good example. Like he, he combines interpretations of Heideggerian phenomenology with Carl Schmitt, both Nazi thinkers, right? <laughs> <laughs> definitely a modernist, not a postmodernist. Um, and so despite the fact that Agamben will utilize Foucault here and there. He always um, checks it with this Heideggerian Schmidtian kind of analysis or foundations, right? And and this makes him an anti-Marxist thinker, I think, just because those foundations are so reactionary and because he 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 rejects anything kind of Marxism has to say about stuff. And then this view leads to uh, what's now this particular notion of sovereignty that has become really important in uh, political philosophy, which I, you know, I actually tried to engage with in a recent essay. Um, and this and this notion of sovereignty really gets in the way of Marxist work about social power uh, within the discipline of philosophy. And then, you know, following him in that kind of post Heideggerian blue, you get you get you get Nancy Esposito and, and a bunch of others who try to remystify social concepts that Marxism actually demystified. And, that, and that's a problem, right? They're, they're taking these things that Marxism has demystified and they're making them more confusing again, which is, you know, completely against what Marxist philosophy is meant to do. Yeah, I really appreciate that answer. I think moving away from just talking about postmodernism or poststructuralism in this context is really helpful. It always sort of surprises me, as much as I understand why as Marxists were so focused on pushing back against that tendency within philosophy, it's also just my experience in philosophy is that when I was hearing strong anti-Marxist perspectives, it was kind of like you said, much more likely to be coming from a Rawls scholar than from someone who would consider them themselves a Foucauldian or a Derridian, or sort of in the department that I came from, it was also sort of American pragmatism and this desire to revive sort of John Dewey's work that got spun in these really weird anti-Marxist ways. And I think it is useful for us when thinking about anti-Marxism philosophy to get beyond just that scope of postmodernism, whatever we take that term to mean, and to sort of think about liberalism more broadly and how that crops up in other forms of philosophy, as you sort of gesture to. Yeah, and for for my part, I mean, I think obviously uh, both Allison and I uh, went to grad school for philosophy and ended up dropping out for various reasons. But I definitely appreciate you saying that philosophy departments specifically are not. I mean, you know, you hear this trope in popular culture, like you know, universities turn people into Marxist, and you know, one might naively think that a philosophy department might even be more Marxist. But in my experience as an undergrad and a grad, it was completely liberal and I even like would put forward Marxist arguments and write papers on Marxism that we you know were, were received sort of lukewarmly and just because of what I was engaging in. And I remember in graduate school, our politically political philosophy course, we obviously read Rawls, but then we went through all of Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And just in retrospect, thinking like who was more relevant to today? You know, I never once did we read Mao or Lenin or Marx at all, but we trudged through all of Anarchy, State, and Utopia. That really does go to <laughs> show the sort of inherent liberalism, especially of philosophy departments. And it's not even necessarily always brutally explicit. It can just be like, what do we study and what do we never even ever mention? You know? Yeah, I know. It's like, that was my experience and I stuck it out. I mean, luckily I, I went to a university that had a good number of Marxists on staff and, you know, the one sole one in my department, I mean, the political science department at the time was overrun by Marxists, but the sole, the sole one, in, there was only one in the philosophy department and he was the Gramsci scholar. <laughs> he's also cross-listed with political science, but his, his tenure was in philosophy. Um, and so I, I worked with him, but I remember when I, I wrote my uh, dissertation proposal and it had to, there's all, there was all this rigmarole of like, you had to, the department had to go and look it over and see if it was a proper philosophical um, dissertation. And I remember this, 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 this asshole philosopher of science, who, you know, was, was one of the people that was the commenters on it, admitted that this wasn't his area, but was like, I don't think this is philosophy. He thinks capitalism is bad for some reason. <laughs> oh my right? God. It's like, what? What was wrong with these people? I mean, thankfully, my committee was like, this guy admitted he doesn't know the area, so why are we? <laughs> why was <why, laughs> right? Right? I mean, but it was just like it was just so the fact that someone felt they could write that without you know realizing how dumb it sounded. That's philo That's philosophy departments. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> All right, so let's go on to the next question. I, I wanted to add a question like this because you 
obviously wrestle with it in your book. You, you talk about it in all of your work. It's very important to Allison and I in our show, Red Menace, to always connect this theoretical or philo- philosophy stuff with you know our actual on-the-ground organizing, etc. So uh, broad question, what are the implications of, of this book, in your opinion, for how we should think about and go about organizing as Marxists in the real world? Well, I think this is, you know, a great question following the last one, right? Um, Because while it's the case that these anti-Marxist strains of philosophy are a problem within academia, the actual philosophical expression of them isn't largely an issue outside of academia. It's not like, you know, you're going to be able to, oh man, this person is a Rawlsian. (laughs) People on the ground. I mean, obviously it's good to know it because there's a default liberalism, right? Due to ruling class ideology, and so, you know, liberalism can play with and transform into these kind of dominant notion within philosophy. But I mean, really what you're dealing with is like kind of liberal ideology, not the people are really seeped in the works of like Rawls or Nozick, right? And so it's it's not like they're they're out there being like, I'm, I'm reading Theory of Justice or something and you can't <laughs> against that. And also there's less of a chance that they're, you know, they're reading a Gembin or Foucault. <laughs> this is not to say the positions that these people have in philosophy don't reflect what 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 certain ideological positions people have in reality, because obviously these philosophies are ideological reflections. But only you don't have to realize that you don't have to worry about like having this like uh, like philosophical argument about about this stuff, right? Um, in any case, uh, yeah. So that was just you know a preamble to go <laughs> to answer this question. Uh, so, I mean, I think the book, to be fair with the book, right, the book occupies a kind of troubled position. So on the one hand, it's written for people familiar with academic philosophy. So people like myself, people like you have been in departments, right, both of you. And, you know, it's and it's an attempt uh, to exercise the kind of this, this ghost of grandiosity <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, it's trying to explain philosophy to the lay reader involved in political organizations they can understand the importance of philosophical practice freed from this canonical conceit conceit um so it it, i don't know how strong it is on both ends like i'm I'm trying to kind of like make it communicable for both but sometimes i might you know horribly fail in both ways or maybe not be maybe if i just focused on one and not the other would be stronger i don't know but I i was trying to do both at the same time so with that in mind what I was advocating for in the book was the importance of philosophical practice. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, the way that I ended it, um, you know, for the, the, the importance of philosophical practice for politically committed cadre and, and, and kind of, it's, you know, a partial foundation for how to think thought, because as I said before, I think critical thinking, and I mean that in the broad, broad sense, right? Not the, the sense of critical thinking textbooks, you know, that's important for political projects. And, you know, I said, it, I, I say it's a, a partial foundation for how to think thought, because, you know, I know it's incomplete, um, that there are some things I overstated or understated, uh, and that it's, you know, only one small step forward in thinking philosophy uh, for from some from people that are in positions of, that are committed to radical politics. That being said, there are some things I say in the last chapter about the relationship between the concrete and theoretical spheres, about how philosophy kind of forms this circuit that can cut through these spheres uh, for useful interventions and in thought. I think I think these insights are useful, and they serve as reminders. Uh, rem- reminders also to myself, right, <laughs> all the time of of how to think our politics, and and really just this is just kind of saying. Let's bring, you know, the, the way that we practice this practice of philosophy, this idea of thinking thought, let's bring into organizing so we can make our organizing stronger. Right. Because in the real world, it's always best to proceed critically, you know, without getting lost. I mean, if you get lost in dogmatism, then you end up getting really weak and broken and you're not. You know, it's, 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 it's not going to like religious thinking does not help a movement and eclecticism, that kind of weird shit that people start theorizing new stuff that, that doesn't go anywhere as well. Right. So having this kind of trying to like, you know, bring back the importance of rigorously thinking our revolutionary theory. That's important, right? So in this sense, it's about how to figure out how to be good mass philosophers. And I think that matters. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you said you're doing both at the same time, of trying to make it accessible and also, um, you know, invigorating and challenging to somebody who's been, you know, in philosophy for a long time. I think you do that really, really well. The Obviously, the intellectual rigor is there for veterans and people who are more accustomed to this stuff. But I just think everything else aside, just the clarity of the way that you write, 
makes it accessible to people that might not, you know, otherwise find these sorts of texts accessible. Uh, so, so that's, that's really good. And yeah, to completely tying it in your, your whole, your whole job of sort of understanding what philosophy actually is, is to sort of subordinate it to, to practice and theory and put it in its proper place so that it doesn't pretend or conceive of itself as doing more than it actually is or even can, uh, which I deeply appreciated about uh, this text overall. Uh, Allison? Yeah, well, so I'll, I'll try to connect this maybe a little bit to the next question as well, because I think that this idea of sort of like being good mass philosophers is very useful. And so obviously, as we've touched upon throughout this interview, like doing philosophy in your view, then isn't this grand ontological project, it's not building the foundations for some sort of uh, metaphysical picture of the world. And so I was just wondering, then, like, in a very like concrete sense for philosophers who are in academia today, how is it that they should approach doing philosophy. So you tell us it's this interpretive process, but what practically can they go about doing that to make it the sort of mass philosophy that you're talking about? And are there any like Marxist philosophers today who you think are doing that well? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> again, it's hard to, you know, I almost feel that if I, especially the second part of the question, if I mention people that are, you know, doing it well, then there's, there's people that will like call me up and like, why didn't you mention me? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> It's a, I, so I gotta you know try to think best about about that. Um, but in terms of the, the, the broader, before I get to to, to naming names, which you know, <laughs> might get me in hot water. Um, look, I mean, within within academia and this kind of struggle, I think, or even just thinking about academia, it's like we should be doing our best to argue that the practice of philosophy is not trapped within academia. <laughs> It is something politically conscious cadre can also practice. But at the same time, right, just because we should be doing that on the one hand, that's so important to say that, you know, academic philosophy does not um, represent what philosophy is. It doesn't have the final say, right? You know, we can even use Althusser's concept. We mentioned him earlier, you know, schools as ISAs, right? Ideological mm -hmm. state apparatuses, right? There's definitely the dominant ruling class ideologies involved in there, right? Um, so we should be emphasizing that, you know, it's not trapped within that, you know, politically conscious cadre can also practice it. But I mean, at the same time, we shouldn't retreat and take on that kind of anti-intellectual reaction to the existence of academic philosophy. So, you know, while I agree that academic philosophy should largely be held to account, of course, and that its authorities have largely been complicit in the maintenance of ruling class philosophy, it is still, you know, a space of struggle, right? Um, and it, we have to understand that all these things are spaces of struggle. And it's interesting, too, because, I mean, right now we're, we're witnessing the rise of the, I mentioned this earlier, kind of this, this rise of a neoliberal university. And it actually wants to obliterate philosophy of the entire humanities in, in, this, in this need to turn universities into professional schools, right? Um, and since a large number of humanities pre professors are more casualized than, you know, professors in other disciplines, like we work, most of us work as adjuncts on contract, you know, such as myself, right? The neoliberalization of the university has had this effect of kind of creating a space of struggle. It's, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's like proletarianization, but it's a, it's a quasi or, you know, semi-proletarianization of our lives, right? Because we always have to struggle for a living wage. We always have to go on strike. We have to accept the worst, shittiest jobs and extra, we take on all the extra dumb work no one else wants to do just so that you know, we can pay our bills in, in order to be academics as well. And it's, it's become part of that. So, you know, it's at the same time, though, you have like a large number of academic philosophers and particularly those who are tenured and those who buy that ideology of tenure, like they fantasize that they're going to be tenured and they become these kind of lapdogs for those people. Like they, they've sadly chosen to accept the fate of, of, of the neoliberal university. Some even actually celebrate it, like, like academic philosophers, because they have this whole idea that, you know, philosophy will still function as an adjunct to the neoliberal reality. We're liberals too, right? You know, and, uh, and so I, I think it's worth str worth struggling against that tendency, just as we should struggle against anti-Marxist tendencies in our department. But there's still spaces of struggle. They're not the prime spaces, and those definitely exist outside of academia, but there's spaces nonetheless. And, and in fact, there are also spaces, at least in my experience, like I don't know, like it's different. I know that every university system is different in the U.S. than it is in Canada. I mean, Canada doesn't have the same um, level of privatization and universities. Um, so, you know, in my university specifically, the the undergraduate department is filled with students from proletarian backgrounds, specifically students from like racialized immigrant backgrounds and things like that. And they come through these departments because now even even to get like a job, like a proletarian job, everyone wants you to have a BA, 
right? So they, they, they appear through philosophy departments. And I think it's important that people are there to like teach them a perspective of philosophy that resonates with their class experience, specifically the one they're going to have when they leave university as well, right? Um, so academia, at least in, in my experience and where I'm at, still remains a space despite all its problems where people have the time to encounter important ideas and study them with the, with, you know, just a, before they go back to like the shitty proletarian reality where they're like, you know, worked without, you know, necessary job, job security or anything like that, right? The kind of people we want to recruit into movements, right? But they have a period of time where they can study revolutionary ideas with time and rigor that's not afforded to them in society at large, unless they're part already of a, of a communist project that can do that for them. So, I mean, we should be trying to establish spaces that can do that for people outside of academia and can give them that rigor and that space. We don't have them yet, right? We need them. But we can still struggle in, in the academic space while not accepting that it's, it's primary for, for organization. Um, I guess that would be my very convoluted way of answering that question before I get to in naming names. <laughs> so uh, when I think of other philosophers who are trying to do kind of this work in academia that, you know, that are, you know, to see the importance of political struggle and, you know, aren't subordinating themselves to this, the, this liberalization or capitulation to the neoliberal university. Um, I mean, I think of my thesis advisor, Esteban Moreira. He was like a lifelong Gramscian scholar. He spent a lot of his youth involved in a lot of struggles around the world. And he's, you know, he taught me, you know, he reinforced, you know, I already had, he, he reinforced the idea that, you know, we shouldn't be detaching political commitment from academic research. And, and then there's also people I know, like my generation in philosophy, um, like Devin Zane Shaw and Matthew McLennan, who, you know, they're not fully Marxist, although they're like very sympathetic to like more Maoist traditions of Marxism. Um, but, you know, what, what, I, what, what strikes me about them is that, like me, they, they, they're, they're dedicated to transforming academic space into a space of struggle, and they've never hidden their political commitments. They've refused to renounce them. They still do mass work and things like that. Um, and then, you know, outside of philosophy, because it's not just, maybe just because, you know, academic philosophy sucks, so there's not many of us. But, I mean, there are, you know, <laughs> academics who have a philosophical mindset, you know, who are performing similar struggles against the liberal tide of academia and in interest of doing mass work outside of academia. So some names I think of are people like Rachel Gorman, who works in disability studies, um, Tyler Shipley, who does, like, kind of political history, uh, Paris Du Saberi, who does, like, you know, uh, radical geography, uh, Jude Welburn, who's, you know, does stuff on, like, kind of, um, you know, you know, literature, actually. But these are people that, you know, have, all of them have, are committed to some form of uh, Marxist or Maoist, even, view of things. And then there's, you know, two upcoming scholars who, you know, are, are in my circles who, you know, whose work I think is going to be really good when I get out there. And that's Louise Tam and Homiun Rastikar, uh, both of who are Ma Maoists. Um, and all, all of these people, right, they, they, they share close to a Maoist ethos, and all of them are struggling against the most pernicious aspects of anti-Marxism academia all the time with their work, right? Um, and we need to kind of build that community of people that are struggling against this kind of anti-Marxism. And much of their practice is philosophical, even though they might be outside of philosophy. And, you know, it's, it's for all of us, and the names I named, we all know it's hard to make a dent in this edifice, uh, but, you know, we're struggling to see who you can bring into, like, movements outside of academia, right? Um, and also lending our services, obviously, not really their services, but lending our skills to, you know, the, the mass mobilization that we do outside of things. So, yeah, I mean, I think we really need to support each other while also finding the roots of our struggles and movements outside of academia. Awesome. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I, yeah, I think my sort of thought process going into the question is as much as we want to insist that philosophy isn't bound exclusively to academia, you know, like you acknowledge sort of the spaces for philosophical education outside of academia are still being built and still have to be built by a communist movement uh, to a large degree. And communists are in academia at the current moment. So this idea of just sort of what do you do if that's where you're at, I think is helpful. And definitely, you know, just hearing some people who are taking that seriously and who are trying to to work as Marxists or as, you know, semi-Marxists, as you say, in academia while also not uh, seeing themselves as detached from broader political struggles. It's just helpful to hear, I think. Yeah, and, and I was, as I was reading this uh, this book before I asked the last question, um, it, it sort of occurred to me when you're thinking about, like, philosophers of Marxists that are doing the sort of 
thing that you're saying, well, you're doing it, right? And like in the same way that like in, in Wretched of the Earth, which we've been reading in um, on Red Menace, Fanon talks about combat literature. And he simultaneously explains what it is and shows how to do it. And in a similar way, I think with all of your work, uh, JMP, you're explaining really important things to explain. At the same time, you're showing us how it can actually be done. And I think that's what makes your work so unique and so treasured by us on the left and our listeners who, you know, the ones that have engaged with your stuff and have learned from you through our shows – um, just hit me up like months later and say like thank you so much for you know having that interview or making me read CNR or whatever because you do play that that wonderful role so uh, so thank you for that and as the final question um, if readers and listeners can take one thing away from this book or this interview what do you hope that it is uh, that philosophy matters and at the same time that it's not impenetrable that it's not too profound for them to grasp as a practice. And then when they realize this, they'll understand they're also potential philosophers. Uh, also that, you know, no, no philosophy functions outside of class struggle and, you know, how to go about thinking thought and why this kind of critical thinking matters. And, you know, I, I, connecting to that, of course, I hope, you know, it leads readers back to the question of the political decision and what this decision means, which for me, you know, is rooted in the concerns of continuity and rupture. Where, you know, not to, you know, be all sectarian or whatever, but still, you know, <laughs> I argue the most salient political decision is the Maoist decision. Uh, uh, and I, I think I do it in a non-sectarian way, uh, but, you know, anything is sectarian these days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but, you know, but what that means is what I'm getting to behind that very specific talk about, you know, Maoism or things is, is what I'm really saying is like involvement in a revolutionary political pr- uh, project. Mm-hmm. And I, I've been certain about that for over a decade. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on again with your new text. Uh, we'll definitely invite you back on everything you put out. There will be a Rev Left or a Red Menace episode on it um, <laughs> because that's just the effect you have on, on our shows and whatnot. Before we let you go, can you just let listeners know where they can find you and your work online? Yeah. Um, well, I'm on Twitter and I have a blog, which I have not been very good at being you know, faithful to putting out regular stuff on it just because of life anymore. And that's uh, MLM Mayhem. Um, and you know, my work is published so far by both, uh, Chris Blebedeb and zero books. And this book specifically was published by zero books and you can, and you can find the links to all the different online stores that have it from there. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, I'll just reiterate, like, don't take these interviews with authors as replacements for actually reading the text. Mm -hmm. If anything we said today sparked your curiosity or hit on something that you want to develop further, definitely read the book because, you know, we we can only ask so many questions and only cover so much of what he covers in the text itself. So definitely. And we'll we'll link to all of that in the show notes to help people find it. Uh, Allison, do you want any last words before we before we break? I just really would like to reiterate uh, how you know appreciative I am for this interview. Really, your work has been super influential on in how I look at Marxism. And I feel like constantly on Red Menace, especially, we're referencing your work to sort of clarify how we're approaching different texts. So it's been a really awesome experience. And thank you so much for coming on. Well, you're welcome. It's always great to be on. 